The freedoms that Yasser Qadi, Sheikh Yasser Qadi, has seen in America and appreciates it, I would advocate those freedoms in Muslim majority lands too. But how about the freedom to publicly blaspheme? Do you think the majority of Muslim countries would want that? Do you think that in Pakistan, in Arabia, in, in, in Morocco, they would want the freedom to go and blaspheme against God and his messenger in the street? They don't want that even. So why would you want to superimpose on them a worldview that is emanating from our upbringing or you know, our current experiences in America? There are universal human values, justice, freedom, uh, peace as opposed to violence, oppression. Is versus... nudity a universal human value? No, it's not. Okay, where did you get that from? Human nature, I think most people, there's some, I believe in something there's called natural law, human fitra. Uh, you know, even so where you get has... fitra from? It's religion. I agree with no, you. No, fitra, <laughs> fitra precedes religion. Welcome, I'm joined by Sheikh Yasser Qadi resident scholar of the East Plano Islamic Center and Dean of the Islamic Seminary of America. Um, one of the few people who have combined a traditional uh, Eastern Islamic seminary education with a Western academic education in Islam. Um, someone who's written many books, articles, has many uh, media appearances, and whose online videos are among the most uh, viewed in the world. Uh, in the English language about Islam, and often referred to as one of the very top, most influential Muslim scholars in the United States. Uh, so thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. We're also joined by Mustafa Akil, uh, affiliate scholar at the Acton Institute's Collins Center for Abrahamic Heritage, and a senior fellow at the Cato Institute. Mustafa is a journalist and author who has been voted one of the top 10 thinkers to Rebuild the World by Prospect Magazine. Uh, his books include uh, Islam Without Extremes, Reopening Muslim Minds, and Why as a Muslim I Defend Liberty. So thank you also Mustafa for joining us. Thank you so much for having, having me Nathan. It's a pleasure to be at Acton always. And now the, the two of you agree on many things, um, including, I presume, uh, some theological views, some moral views, uh, a desire to cultivate a just society, and a belief that open conversation and exchange of ideas uh, can help us achieve that end. Mm -hmm. So we're here today to reason together about a topic that is both uh, timeless and timely, and that is the relationship between government and religion. In particular, today we want to discuss how Muslims should think about this question. Uh, should government and religion be separate? Or if not, in what ways should they be connected? Um, so Sheikh Qadi, um, I'm wondering if you can open our discussion with some preliminary reflections mm -hmm. on this topic for us in uh, no more than 10 minutes or so. Okay, uh, so <clears throat> Bismillah. let me begin with a personal disclaimer and then three topical disclaimers before I give a summary statement. My personal disclaimer is that I am not a political scientist. I'm actually a theologian trained in Islamic law. And so obviously uh, I will not be quoting Locke or um, uh, any of the famous philosophers or you know, uh, Kant or anybody of that nature because that's not really my forte or field. I am a, a specialist in Islamic sciences and Islamic law. Uh, and obviously as somebody who's been living in the, uh, and raised in the Western world, I've had to uh, come to terms with the reality of how to reconcile our Islamic identity and law with the broader society around us. Uh, the three topical disclaimers I have about this is that, uh, first and foremost, I don't believe that one particular scenario fits all solutions. In other words, uh, depending on where we are, depending on the cultures we live in, different societies have different problems, and these different problems require different solutions. So when you ask this question in the American context, it's not the same as asking it in, let's say, the Arabian context or in a Pakistani context. So it is a bit presumptuous to think that there is one answer that fits every single society on the globe. Uh, the second uh, topical disclaimer I'd have is that 
Uh, I also believe that no matter which uh, solution one chooses, there's always going to be pros and cons. Uh, so what we need to do is to choose the solution that will minimize the cons and maximize the pros, right? And there's always going to be negatives. You're never going to have a watertight, perfect solution that's going to be uh, acceptable to every single person. In fact, that's the nature of politics. Uh, and the last disclaimer I have before I get to my, my statement is that we really have to be extremely wary of our own internal biases of the problem of projecting our values and inherently viewing them as superior to all other values and all other people's, especially when we, meaning the two of us in particular, might be coming from lands or places of power and speaking to peoples who are subjugated, colonized, marginalized, where the power imbalance and even the nation state dynamics might have unintended consequences. Specifically, as Americans, we are living in this country here. I mean, we have invaded, you know, multiple lands and destroyed large civilizations in the last few decades. Uh, more than a million people have been killed. It, at this stage of our, of our existence, for us to presumptuously assume that we are in a position to pontificate about which you know, government is the most conducive for the welfare of mankind. I think we need to humble ourselves and realize that this is an experiment we're all trying, they're all trying, and you know, um, it's conversation is gonna perhaps you know, just better our understandings of each other's worldviews. With those three um, uh, generic uh, uh, caveats, let me state that uh, I think the fundamental issue uh, that is at stake here is that to all too often, people who engage in this topic of how much religion should be involved in politics are actually coming from very different paradigms. And so they end up speaking past one another. So for example, what exactly do you want your political system to achieve? A political system whose ideology is meant to nurture morality, whose, whose very uh, purpose is to prevent immorality, to, to foster a sense of good faith. That's a radically different political system than one that is based on maximizing individual you know, uh, pleasures and individual choices. And also a society that is largely faith-based, a society that is accustomed to communitarian standards of even a social enforcement of a type of morality is a radically different society, such as the one in America, in which faith is viewed as a private matter, in which individualism always trumps com communitarianism. As well, uh, a society that largely believes in immutable uh, virtue morality is radically different. It's not the same as the one in which morality is viewed as utilitarian, in which morality can be updated or changed from time to decade to era to place. And so with all of this reality, I would say that generally speaking, most Muslim majority countries would have ideas of politics and political systems that are radically different than most people living in the Western liberal world. And therefore, for the two of us to engage in a fruitful conversation, we first have to define what is the goal of a political system. If the goal of the political system is merely just uh, to live and let live, well then, that goal in and of itself might not be uh, uh, very popular amongst large segments of the Muslim world. And this is demonstrated by multiple examples which, which we can get into in the uh, Q&A and the discussions that we have. On the other hand, if the goal is merely to maximize you know, uh, uh, one's uh, personal choices, one's personal freedoms, that goal, well, the answer to the question is, is then going to be radically different. Hence, to basically conclude on, a, uh, on, a, uh, on the question that you asked me, I would say that the question of whether religion and government need to be separate or the level of uh, interaction, it actually requires a deeper discussion that what is the role of religion in that particular society? What type of government is that society aiming for? Uh, for which peoples are we talking about? It is impossible to answer this question with a definitive one size fits all solution. And I say clearly for the record, as an American, based on the history of America, the trajectory of America, the constitution of America, the social dynamics of America, I fully understand that religion and a government is going to be separate. Yet I would hope that Americans and uh, 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 people who are in power or intellectuals in power understand that that sentiment might not be popular across the globe and that other societies might want a government, uh, might want a political system that is more reflective of their faith values. And they might actually prefer a, a government in which there's a soft morality in place. They do want some checks and balances in public order in society. And I would hope that uh, for those of us on this side of the Atlantic, we understand that uh, they should have the freedom to make those choices choices as well, and they should also be respected for coming to different conclusions than we might possibly do on the ideal form of government.
Thank you, Dr. Kadi. Uh, Mustafa, could you also um, provide some opening reflections on how you see this relationship between religion and government? Of course. Uh, thank you again, Nathan, for uh, bringing us together. It's a pleasure to meet uh, Dr. Yasser Kadi, Sheikh Yasser Kadi, in person. And, Call me Yasser, uh, it's fine. Uh, Yasser Kadi, I'll, I'll prefer, and uh, Sheikh Yasser Kadi. And now, I actually want to begin by uh, a, a recent sermon I listened from uh, Yasser Qadi, Sheikh Yasser Qadi, and I liked a lot. He gave a recent sermon titled Islam in America to a Muslim audience. And there he said, American Muslims have a blessing that no other country on earth has, which is this country's constitution to protect our freedoms. Then uh, he continued and he said, we thank Allah for those freedoms. We thank Allah that no one can legislate away my freedom to worship my God in accordance with my conscience. Now, I was listening to this in the car and I said, yes, alhamdulillah, that's great. That's a great point. Uh, because I think there are many reasons that uh, Muslim societies across the world are critical of Western powers, especially regarding their foreign policy. That goes back to colonialism, that goes to American foreign policy in the Middle East and different parts of the world. But there is something else which is uh, in the West, especially in America, where indeed the Constitution is designed to protect religious freedom, right, and freedom of expression. Muslims have found an environment where they can't fully practice their religion without anybody persecuting them, without them persecuting each other as well. In America, you have the whole ummah, I mean, from the most, you know, strict Salafis to more mainstream Sunnis to Shia Muslims to other groups that aren't even considered Muslim, but they themselves define as Muslims like Ahmadis. And they all have their you know, places of worship and nobody is telling them what to do, or what to preach in their mosques and so on and so forth. Now, is this a good thing? Is, this, is having a political system like this where the government's job is to protect the freedom of everybody, religious communities and other people, you know, is this a good thing or not? Now, uh, you say, uh, Sheikh Yasser, that countries have different values and traditions. We cannot standardize all. I mean, I agree with that, of course. But also, when we see something bad, we can criticize it in, in some parts of the world. For example, China has a very oppressive political system, which is persecuting the Uyghur Muslims brutally, genocidally, you know, in, in camps and by enforced uh, abortions and so on and so forth. In India, the majority, among the majority Hindus, there is a movement called Hindutva, it's been called as Hindu militancy or, or nationalism, which is threatening the Muslim minority. And should we say, well, it's the way they do things in India, or should we say, no, there is a universal value called religious freedom, uh, which we see here in America that is, that is being enjoyed by Muslims. And, uh, but, but should we, um, I believe that there are some universal values rooted in human nature, rooted accessible by reason, justice, freedom, religious freedom, freedom of expression. And I can uh, root them in our own Islamic tradition in, in certain you know, passages of the Quran as well, and we can speak about those. I believe in advocating those. Therefore, the freedoms that Yasser Qadi, Sheikh Yasser Qadi, has seen in America and appreciates it, I would advocate those freedoms in Muslim-majority lands too, for Muslims themselves and for the non-Muslim minorities in those Muslim-majority lands. Uh, from Christians in Pakistan or other groups in, uh, in, in different parts of the world. Now, you know, and one, one point that, uh, again, Sheikh Yasser uh, mentioned is colonialism. Now, when we speak about these issues, Muslims always remember, of course, French, the French occupied Algeria, colonized it, saying, we're bringing you civilization, right? Mission civil, civilisatrice, or my French isn't very good. Uh, and Muslims have seen, actually, when Napoleon invaded Egypt in, 19, uh, in the beginning of the 19th century, he said, actually, we are bringing freedom. So there, because of Western colonialism, understandably, Muslim societies are careful about what these people are speaking about and sometimes very guarded against it. But certainly that's not I'm advocating. I also come from Turkey, which was never colonized, which in which Muslims themselves had thought of these kinds of ideas coming from the West, like constitutionalism, equal rights for everybody, uh, representative democracy, 
Ottoman scholars began uh, discussing these in the late 19th century. They reconciled with Islam in their own interpretations. Turkey itself adopted its laws based on European Union in the more modern era. And that's been good for Turkey, for everybody in Turkey, Muslims themselves and other groups as well. So I understand his point about there are differences in the world. And yeah, we should not imagine a world that everybody wears blue jeans and eat McDonald's and whatever. Uh, cultures certainly have uh, their uh, traditions, and especially we Muslims, and we should preserve them. But I think politics is a universal uh, area where there can be values we can uphold. One more thing, uh, Shah Yasser got to emphasize that, you know, a, a society that wants to nurture morality and wants to max the other one that maximizes freedom, these are two different things. These can be two different things, but these can be compatible because maximizing freedom doesn't always mean maximizing freedom for people who want to be immoral, right? It's maximizing people for freedom to be, for people who want to be very moral, very traditional. Uh, in America, that's why freedom means the Amish can be very conservative in their way of life. Orthodox Jews can be very traditional in their way of life. Muslims can be very traditional in their way of life. And I think when we try to nurture, f nurture morality, not within freedom, but through mechanisms of coercion, as we see in the Muslim world today in Afghanistan or uh, Saudi Arabia or Iran, Actually, it leads to immorality because imposed morality through the state leads to hypocrisy, leads to resentment, even it leads to alienation from religion. So I don't see a tension between freedom and morality. I think actually we should have them together. Thank you, Mustafa. Um, so uh, Sheikh Qadi, uh, in your opening remarks, you were very sensitive to the fact that different cultures uh, and different groups of people require different political solutions. Um, and, and Mustafa highlighted that he would like the freedoms enjoyed by Muslims in non-Muslim lands to also exist in Muslim majority countries. And it sounds Musta like Mustafa, you see some sort of tension between um, saying, for example, that um, Muslims in the United States, for example, can enjoy certain freedoms, but in Muslim majority countries, non-Muslims might not get all of those same freedoms sometimes. Or Muslims themselves, of course. Or Muslims they can themselves. Be, you know, they can be under dictatorship. One more thing, not all, of course, non-Muslim countries are good. I mean, I just mentioned China. In France, actually, there is a whole tradition of laïcité, which I've criticized all my life because its Turkish version was even more oppressive than France. And we see very illiberal practices like banning headscarves or religious symbols. So, but countries like America, which is based on, I mean, Yasser Kadi mentioned political philosophy, ideas that goes back to John Locke, the idea that a proper government should only protect the rights, natural rights of every citizen. I think that's a good idea, which has worked well in the Western tradition. And, uh, well, this will open up questions whether Islam has its own political system already established and we should preserve, or is politics a more rational area, which we can keep discussing. But I think maybe we'll come to that through the discussion. Yeah, sorry, I interrupted. And, and I've heard you also invoke the golden rule uh, to argue that, you know, if, if we are enjoying rights in a non-Muslim land, then should not we uh, advocate for those rights in Muslim lands as well. Yeah, exactly. Um, um, so Sheikh Qadi, how do you uh, see that possible tension? Uh, does that create any type of problem? Mm. How do you resolve that? So I go back to my point of me being very wary about the uh, power disparity, about us speaking from positions of power over and above civilizations that have actually been physically hurt by our foreign policy. And so we have to be careful here when Mustafa, myself and others speaking from within the American paradigm, assume that we know best how to rule over other lands and peoples. And we start uh, calling out what we perceive to be injustices. You know, we have to understand we invaded Afghanistan on the premise we sold our people a lie that we're going to liberate women and the freedom of women to wear, the, the, to wear whatever they want or not wear anything. And of course, uh, the uh, intermixing of our foreign policy with this trope of we're going to liberate these savages. This goes back 300 years. We can change the language. We're not calling them savages, but we're still having this 
sentiment that we are somehow superior. Our values are better than theirs. Well, guess what happened? We killed a million people, we spent seven trillion dollars, and the women of Afghanistan still want to wear the hijab willingly. So we understand here, we have to be really careful about assuming we know what's best for them. My position and advice is, hey, and I've spoken to people in Pakistan in this regard directly, like, hey, uh, can you explain to me why you have this policy? Maybe you guys should think about trying to change it, but that's on them to do. Let them organically figure out what is the best way. Because here's my point back to Mustafa and others, this notion of, of, of freedom, I think we all agree, freedom to worship and freedom to be religious in your personal life. We all agree this is an ideal, and even Islamic, even the most conservative interpretation of Islamic law would allow that. But how about the freedom to publicly blaspheme? Do you think the majority of Muslim countries would want that? Do you think that in Pakistan, in Arabia, in, in, in Morocco, they would want the freedom to go and blaspheme against God and his messenger in the street? They don't want that even. So why would you want to superimpose on them a worldview that is emanating from our upbringing or you know, our current experiences in America? And again, we have to bring in the issue of morality. This is one of the sensitive topics that always comes in in this regard. Do you really think the majority of Muslim countries want the freedom to uh, allow promiscuity and immorality uh, in a manner that is completely unrestricted. Now, what that fine line is, every country is going to be different. But I think we would all agree that you know, the average parent, the average person would not want even in this country, we're banning marijuana in, in most states, right? I mean, from a purely secular perspective, you can make a st stronger argument for alcohol than you can for marijuana. The, the, the damage and the harm that is done from alcohol. So the majority of Muslim countries would not want the types of moral freedoms. The types of freedoms you're talking about, everybody wants them. The freedom to criticize their government, the freedom to worship God as they see fit. Those are not the freedoms that anybody is really contesting. We're talking about the types of liberal freedoms that also guarantee, and this is a slippery slope, and I mentioned this in the very talk that you mentioned. I actually mentioned this there, that the very freedoms that allow us to be you know, uh, uh, good Muslims and allow us to criticize the government, well, uh, the problem is, at least in the, in the way that the freedoms are practiced, in this country, it also allows people to do things that we don't like. And we have to, you know, that's a, that's a quid pro quo. We have to do that. But my point is, do you really think people in most Muslim countries would want to open up that Pandora's box of the freedom of morality versus immorality? And I would argue, and I think statistics show, that is definitely not the case. All right, Mustafa. So Sheikh Qadi makes some good points um, sure. here, in, here in the West. Uh, Pakistan's blasphemy law, for example, sounds... Horrific, no. but if you speak to most people from Pakistan, they want those laws. So why should we want to force yeah. unwanted laws on people whose cultures are wildly different from ours here in America? And in India, a lot of Hindus want to punish Muslims for eating beef, you know, from their <laughs> point of view. So should we welcome that or not? Well, uh, Sheikh Yasser made a few points. Let me go uh, just. The power of despair, I mean, you mentioned when we invaded, I mean, that's America. I was in America at the time, and I'm not, you know, uh, so I was in Turkey. Uh, like, I don't even follow the U.S. foreign policy in that sense. As like, I can't say from an American point of view. But I made it clear, Western invasions, occupations, supposedly for bringing freedom, I'm against all those. I've been against all those all my life. We're not speaking about those. And actually, those things actually have hurt the cause of freedom. I mean, I, I believe in freedom as a universal idea, but when you use this for a sinister political agenda, you harm it. And that's why a lot of libertarians in America, including Cato Institute that I work, actually op oppose things like the U.S. occupation of Iraq or other you know, colonial uh, things of Europe in the, in, in the past. Now, this doesn't, again, leave it. This doesn't, for example, stop us from discussing whether democracy is a good thing or not. And also, the West doesn't always, you know, ask for democracy in Muslim majority countries. I mean, it is the West's own system, but we have seen Western governments actually not wanting democracy because they think a government will come to power that will not serve on their interests. So let's leave aside Western foreign policy. We can condemn whatever uh, needs to be condemned there, or if Russian occupation of, uh, it's not just the West. There are a lot of powers active in the world that have done terrible things. But are there political values and ideas that we can discuss? Like, should the ruler be elected by the people, democracy, or should he be coming in a monarchical inheritance system? 
Well, Muslims began discussing this in late Ottoman Empire, and they said shura, constitution, these ideas, you know, came into discussion. Now, I, uh, Sheikh Yasser Qadi highlights issues that will, of course, to especially many Muslims. Do you want people to be promiscuous on the streets or blaspheme? I don't want those things. But having laws about those things, in a way, actually, that hurts a lot of innocent people for their sincere beliefs. I'm, I'm against that. In Pakistan, for example, we know blasphemy law is a major issue. It's, it's, it's in the laws, and also there's this huge social anxiety about that. Innocent people just get blamed just for a, a Christian has a, has a quarrel with uh, some Muslims, which has happened to a lady named Asya Bibi. Uh, she just said, oh, they blaspheme against Prophet Muhammad. You can prove against it. Then you, uh, you are in death row for many years. So let me say again, when we defend the idea of freedom, some people will say things, some people will do things that we do not approve. And we don't have to approve those things. But going after those things by the power of the state, that's a different discussion. If we don't like immorality, what do we do? We can preach morality. We can show a moral way of life is better. We have the right to do those things. And yes, every society has a public morality, what you can wear, how you can dress. I understand those things. But I would also not agree with uh, the Sheikh Yasser that everybody wants the political freedoms. I mean. You probably know certain scholars in, in the Gulf which will say, never speak against the ruler, you know, obey the ruler, whatever he says, don't get into any discussion. Well, that's an Islamic point of view in their uh, point of view. I don't agree with that. So uh, I don't want to bring this discussion of freedom to issues where Muslims are morally disapproving. We can disapprove those things, but there's a whole range of issues here from religious minorities. Let me ask one question, apostasy, for example. Uh, imagine some people, and that happens, people become, they convert from Islam to Christianity. Uh, this has happened in Iran, this has happened in uh, several countries, including Saudi Arabia. In our traditional interpretations of the Sharia, uh, apostasy is considered as a crime. Of course, was that only, was that really leaving the religion or political rebellion as well? There are endless discussions about those. I'm of the opinion that we should respect people's religious freedom. We don't want to see people uh, deserting from Islam, but if they do, it's their choice. And we should establish religious freedom laws everywhere in the Muslim world that we don't uh, punish, go after people for apostasy, for example. So is this a moral thing? Is this a political thing? For example, what would you think about issues like that? So when it comes to specifically interpreting, so again, you're talking about a Muslim majority country. And I say here again, you're saying that um, uh, we have caused a lot of hurt in those regions. You're trying to disassoci disassociate yourself from that hurt. But I go back to this point, the very fact we are discussing what we are discussing from the place we're discussing it. We are not speaking from a vacuum. And so when you come and you say, I would want those countries to do this, I'm really sensitive of the fact we are overstepping our bounds. I am a firm believer of local actors, local activists, local preachers, local politicians, organically within their own communities, bring about sentiments that can gain traction and let them. Now we have the right to discuss with them one-on-one, -on -one, but for sure, this, this presupposition that we know what's best for those people, I am against this completely. And so if a certain country decides that, hey, we want this public law, and again, I'm not defending Pakistan, I'm not criticizing Pakistan, even though I'm Pakistani ethnically, my parents came from Pakistan, I'm, it's nothing to do with Pakistan per se, but I've been there enough times to know the blasphemy laws in the constitution are not abetting or is preventing the mob mentalities on the streets. That's one thing, this is another thing. The mob mentality is a problem we need to solve. We all agree with that. Whether those laws about blasphemy exist or not is not gonna change the sentiment of the ignorant people when they see something that they think is blasphemy, right? So but we have to differentiate between Even through legal measures, people are being persecuted because of their sincere beliefs or just maybe even something they didn't say so but someone thought that they So I spoke with said. some of the senior muftis of Pakistan in this regard, and I spoke with them one one in this regard. Uh, I am not a constitutional expert of Pakistani law, but they explained to me that what is illegal is the provocation, public provocation of blasphemy. It is not illegal to believe what you believe. It is not illegal to practice your belief, to be a Christian or uh, uh, even a Hindu. You can be a Hindu in, in Pakistan, which is actually a minority position in classical Islamic law. Pakistan allows that. No problem. You can worship your gods. But if you go in public and you say vulgar things about you know, the Prophet Muhammad, uh, sorry, Salam, uh, 
the, the law is going to take you into account and you will be punished for that. You're going to go to jail for that. Now, I don't have a problem with that law and I'm not criticizing and I'm not going to endorse it or, or, or be critical. of it. That's a law that they feel is valid for their society and, you know, good for them. There should be some public order. We have, uh, well, in America, we have the First Amendment. But in every single European country, without exception, there are laws against speech. As you know this. As you hate know speech this. laws. There, there are, so then, why would they be problematic for Pakistan to have its version of hate speech laws? And we don't seem to complain about Germany or about France or about Netherlands or about England. This is where I think I have to push back gently at you. It's as if we're only irritated when Muslim majority countries try to exert their Islamic influences on their societies. And we seem to overlook completely when your, our European counterparts are essentially doing the exact same things. As you're well aware, we're speaking from a context now recently, political protests for Palestine have been banned in four European countries. Where is the outcry? Where is the outrage? How come those who are advocating freedom of speech and freedom of religion are all of a sudden silent? So this level of hypocrisy is always displayed time and time again. And that is why you will not find me a willing participant to say, oh, look at Pakistan, look at Iran, because I also say, look at Europe, and frankly, sometimes look at our own country as well. And I say, we're all doing things that are you know, contrary to ideal. And I go back to my point, let local Pakistani activists and actors, let local Pakistani ulama decide what they should do. And I have no problem. As I said, I've spoken to them one-on-one. -on -one. I spoke to one of the most senior muftis there, and I said to him, you know, these, these, these blasphemy things that you guys are doing, you need to preach against them. And he himself said, our hands are tied. These are the masses. It's not the law. These are people that are ignorant of the faith and we're trying our best to get rid of it. Nobody's happy at, you know, the, 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 the mob mentality in Pakistan. But if you've been to these countries, you know, it's... Uh, well, yeah, anyway, I mean, in Pakistan, mob mentality and the legal process is different. And exactly. the Obandi, for example, scholars have been saying, you know, we should, it should happen through the courts. So that, that is better than the uh, mob mentality. I, I'll, I'll say that. Uh, I, I agree with you that, I mean, European countries especially can be very hypocritical and they have, might have double standards when it comes to free speech. I publicly criticize those bans on uh, pro-Palestinian protests. Uh, and as the international and groups like that, or human rights organizations like that have also criticized because they're taking, I think, a more principled stand on this. That's why I believe American standards of free speech are better than the European. Uh, for Americans, I say, I don't believe universally. For Americans, they're better. We're used to it. We're accustomed to it. We've signed on to the program. Here's the point. If you're born here, well, it's your choice. You want to live here or not. If you come to this country like you did, you sign on to the program, right? That's fine. And I'm willing, as an American citizen, born and raised here, I'm absolutely willing to understand our constitutional rights. I don't have to agree with the Supreme Court's decision. I don't have to. But I respect and abide by the law of the land. The, say, the point is, if you go to Pakistan, you have to sign up to the same ideals. They have their version of laws. They have their understanding of society. And if you don't like it, well, then either work to change it or go somewhere else. There is no doubt that we do obey the law of the land. But if we see a law as unjust, we can criticize that law as unjust everywhere in the Fair world. The, I mean, China yeah. has laws. We criticize them. what you're saying is fine. I, so, I agree with you. Uh, so, Sheikh, Sheikh Qadi, um, you've emphasized the importance of local solutions that take the cultural context into account. Um, and, and to some degree, I'm sure Mustafa agrees with that. Um, also in the Catholic tradition, you might call that subsidiarity. Um, but are there any common principles that you think should um, be consistent across different political systems, irregardless of, of cultural context? Or is everything dependent yes. upon the culture? The freedom to worship according to your faith tradition in your personal life and manner that doesn't harm anybody else, I think that is an Islamic and universal freedom. The freedom to be religious in your own personal life, as long as you're not physically, if there's a human sacrifice element of the ancient Incas, where we gotta, we gotta put our law, our, our, you know, our, some laws. Burning there, but wife. Yeah, in, yeah, in, in that, yeah, the sati, sati the practice yeah. of sati, yeah. which by the way, interestingly enough, the Mughals tolerated grudgingly, and you know, the British, the, the British came in, because the Mughals said, what can we do? We don't want you to do this. The Mughal emperor, by the way, there's an interesting point here. Akbar and others, they tried to debate with the, uh, the Hindu pundits. They tried to get them to stop, but they refused. And they're like, okay, well, that's your law. If you want to do it, we don't like it. So well, they gave them the freedom to actually do that, which is an interesting uh, point here. But uh, uh, to, to respond to your question, I do believe there are certain uh, universal uh, uh, values, and amongst them should be, as I said, 
the, the, for us, for me as a cleric, the most important thing is that no uh, entity should force you to practice a faith that you don't want to practice. There should be freedom to, because for me as a religious person, the most important freedom, I go back to the Bible. What did Moses say to Pharaoh allegedly in the Old Testament? Let my people free so that they may worship God, right? For me, that is the ultimate freedom that is needed. And if that freedom is given, uh, the rest we can begin to talk about in a more, you know, <laughs> a reasonable manner. But yes, now obviously political freedoms, by the way, I have to raise an awkward point here. And when I say this, please understand, I'm not justifying, I'm simply bringing up awkward realities of history. Of course, one side of me definitely wants political freedoms and we want the freedom for democracy, the freedom to elect. But I cannot help but think about the last 30, 40 years of the Middle East and the fact that certain countries that lived under dictatorships actually flourished GDP-wise, health-wise, education-wise in manners that no other countries did. And I'll mention two or three. This is not an endorsement. This is a problematization so that we don't, we move beyond this, these simplistic tropes because once again, and I have to bring this in, we have this assumption, let us go bomb them into democracy. Let us go and invade and, and give them the freedoms that we have. And we've seen those realities. The most a uh, well-educated Arab country, the highest GDP, the most prestigious Arab universities, and the best healthcare system in the entire Arab world was 1960s, 70s, 80s Iraq. There's no number two, this is like number one. We know this is not a defense of the guy on top. Believe me, I don't like him at all. This is not a defense of Saddam and his policies. But in the end of the day, you talk to Iraqis that have lived through that, and I've spoken to dozens of them. They all hated that guy, but they said, our life back in the 80s, our life in Iraq in the, was unparalleled. The same goes for Libya. That guy was a brutal, brutal dictator. Yet the stability of his people, the GDP that they enjoyed, the free healthcare and education, the infrastructure. So again, and this is not an endorsement at all. It is simply the problematization and the overcoming of our simplistic tropes that freedom is good for everybody and democracy is good for everybody. Well, you know what? Sorry, millions of Iraqis and, 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 and Libyans would actually say the dictatorship of those brutal guys was better for our family life because as long as we didn't criticize that one guy, as long as we let him be and, 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 and steal his millions and whatever, he gave the billions back down to us and he actually built a country for us. And again, this is not a defense because on a personal level, I know my teachers and friends who have been tortured by those two people in jails. I know religious scholars that have been, you know, faced the, the, the brutality of those regimes. But I'm just trying to make sure that we overcome these simplistic stereotypes that I'm a little bit tired of when we hear all the time, freedom, democracy, this and that. It doesn't work that simplistic in every single place in the world. A, a thinker named Edmund Burke, you know, would agree yes. with your uh, points okay. there. I mean, I'm not uh, a naive promoter of democracy. When you throw elections, a country will become a heaven next day. Uh, that's not the case. But the question is, can we see freedom as an ideal to which we which can aspire for and to which we can work in our societies and to religious freedom and, and political freedom as well. Now, uh, one thing, you mentioned that in Afghanistan, uh, US pulled out, it was wrong for them to stay that long. I agree with that, all that. So It was wrong for them to invade. Maybe the first attack on Al-Qaeda, debatable, but yes, I was against that whole, I'm against these endless wars, I could say that. But you said when U.S. pulled out, now Afghanistan women, uh, ladies, their uh, sisters, you know, wear the hijab willingly. Well, some wear willingly, some don't. And that's precisely why the Taliban is forcing them, right? I mean, the idea that there is this one norm in Muslim-majority societies, uh, Kabul is different from the countryside. Which brings me to the discussion of this morality and, and, and of course, Islam in issues about Sharia. I ask you about apostasy. I don't know what you th think about that. But it is, I think, a fact that in our traditional interpretations of our Sharia in, in classical fiqh, we have elements of religious coercion. Apostasy is seen as a crime punishable by death. There is there's Hispa, which is actually began as market policing, which was, I think, from the Prophet's time, peace be upon him, but turned into religious policing. So forcing people to be practicing and pious, like forcing them to do their regular prayers. And of course, hijab and, and uh, forcing women to wear the hijab and things like that. Now, 
let's leave aside foreign, Western foreign policy for one second. I believe these measures, which I call religious coercion, I've written against these things, I've been critical of these things. I don't find a basis for them in the Quran. And I think today they have, they're not serving our religion and they're actually hurting innocent people. You know, in Iran, they're trying to impose hijab on all women. Well, let the women, ladies, sisters, decide what they were gonna wear. Some willingly wear, as you said, that's wonderful, we should fully respect it. Some willingly wear the niqab, I stand for their freedom too in, in Europe, but others don't. For example, I believe governments should not coerce them. Uh, apostasy should not be a crime if we don't want people to, you know, change their religion. But if that happens, that should be a freedom we should ac accept as, uh, I believe non-Muslims should be able to give da'wah in, in Muslim majority countries as we can give da'wah <laughs> in America and elsewhere. So on these issues of clear, I can say, religious coercion, that I would call religious coercion, what, what is your approach and do we have room here? I, I know these are shari issues and you're very well versed in these issues. Uh, how much room do you think we have here to move, move, move forward is maybe a right, right, uh, wrong term, make some changes that would rationally make sense and bring more freedom to Muslim majority so, societies and minorities? So again, Mustafa, we, we go back to this, this notion of the assumption that your particular interpretation is going to be the best one for every single scenario and situation. And I, again, push back at you. You think hijab should not be forced. I'm not saying you should, I'm not saying you shouldn't. Firstly, the whole hijab issue has been fetishized way beyond what it needs to be. We are obsessed with what women can and cannot wear. And we are ignoring the fact that at some level, every single society, including our own, has decency laws. It is not allowed in this country for women to not dress in specific ways and whatnot. And we don't seem to say, oh, why doesn't a foreign country invade us so that women can go topless, so women can go naked or whatever. There's this, there's this um, fetishization of one particular clothing item, which I think has really been blown out of proportion and been justified to blow people out of proportion in this regard as well. Uh, listen, let every government decide what it wants to be decency and morality. Again, and you know this as having lived in the Muslim country, most Muslim countries would not be comfortable uh, allowing uh, uh, pornography to be displayed in public. Heck, even in America, yes. it's not allowed to do it in public. But, I mean, so then, so these here, are extreme. So then it just, no, here you go extreme. Now we just get to the level then. What level of the body, what percentage of the body should be covered? And again, I go back. Let's leave the uh, Sharia out of it for one second. Why can't every single society come and decide on its own decency level? So here in America, we are comfortable with the two-piece. By the way, we weren't comfortable with the two-piece, you know, back in the 1920s. In the 1920s, it was illegal to wear what is called a bikini. A bikini came in the 1940s, actually, named after the atomic bomb and the bikini atoll. They literally thought this is gonna be like a nuclear explosion. A lady, as you're aware, was arrested in this country for wearing a one-piece bathing suit because it went 21 inches or 22 inches whatever the, the law was above her foot. It had to go all the way so a certain number of you know, inches uh, you know, below, her, below her shin, excuse me. 100 years ago, right? In France, we just got a lady that was arrested for wearing the burqa. So if we open this door, Mustafa, there's complete uh, uh, hypocrisy in every single country that you look at. Why are we fetishizing Iran or Afghanistan and not our own countries? Let them decide what they want decency or not. Now, from an Islamic perspective. Let who decide there? The people of their own countries. Are let, they making an election in Afghanistan and so, making a referendum so again, on these issues? So again, we go back to this issue, issue of, for the time being, look at the Taliban, and this is not a defense of them. After $7 trillion, and they come back into power because the people actually preferred them over the chaos that was left in the wake of the American invasion. And you know this is what uh, yeah, I do. in the 90s, okay. that's true. Yeah. So this is the reality then. So this is, who are we then to expect that our system is is gonna work best for them. Yes, theoretically, let's discuss no problem, but I'm really cautious. We go back to this point of assuming that one particular solution will, will, will work best for them. The Taliban, I don't like a lot of what they do. The people would rather prefer the stability of the Taliban along with their idiosyncratic under interpretations of the Sharia than the chaos and the complete you know, bloodthirsty uh, mafia warfare that was going on for over 15 years in Afghanistan. So if the Taliban come with safety and security and they require women to wear the face veil, the locals accepted that over the freedom to dress immodestly and yet you, you'd be robbed, potentially raped, uh, people are bloodthirsty and, and the mafia is ruling the streets of Kabul. So we have to look at real politics as it's going on in Afghanistan. To answer your question about 
changing in Sharia. This has gotten me into a lot of trouble all the time because, again, people are we're, we're, we're trying to talk to people that are fundamentalists, people that are progressives. My position has been consistently clear. The application of the Sharia in the modern nation state is something that can and should be discussed by the ulama and the political thinkers of those regions. I am open to this idea. And it is at some level not possible to apply the totality of the Sharia in a nation state. Halak mentions this and summarizes the argument. Impossible state. Yeah, in, in cogently in his book, The Impossible State. The, 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 the concept of a nation state is radically different than the concept of a caliphate. And the Sharia has come for a caliphate. So I am not advocating every single law of the Sharia be copied and pasted uh, and then put into a nation state. I've never said that. But I am advocating local people who know their culture best, look at the Sharia, and then come to conclusions. Let me give you a, a simple, controversial, and yet practical example. Uh, pornography and, 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 and uh, prostitution. Right. In this country, prostitution is banned. On what basis? We all know this is remnants of Christian fundamentalism. There's no capitalist reason to ban prostitution. We know this, right? These are remnants of a notion that this, this, this um, uh, enterprise is immoral and it should not be. be and yet pornography was slowly but surely contested over the Hayes, the Hayes Code of the 60s, whatever it was, and slowly but surely over the last 40, 50 years, now pornography is completely legal. There had to be multiple Supreme Court cases as recently as 1971 or 72 when, when you know, indecency was taken up to the Supreme Court, right? So you see here an active dynamic change of Western laws vis-a-vis -vis pornography. And perhaps even uh, a prostitution is gonna follow suit. Why should Muslims have to follow Western notions here? Why can't Muslim countries say, hey, we don't want public prostitution? Because I don't see them as Western notions. I mean, I think, for example, uh, well, I <laughs> see religious freedom based in Quranic verses like La Ikrafi Din, there's no compulsion in religion. So they might have thrived more in the West. Actually, West was less free than Islam until a few years ago on many of those issues. I mean, you know, I mean, the, the West was the place where they had inquisition and uh, Protestants and Catholics were slaughtering each other. We had more freedom than the West. John Locke himself quotes. John Locke himself refers to the Ottoman Empire. Early Enlightenment thinkers referred to the Ottoman Empire saying that, look, there are different churches and they're not forcing, you know, Christians to be Muslim. So I don't see this, I mean, this whole East-West, I understand the power dynamics there, but I do believe, if you leave that aside, there are universal human values, justice, freedom, uh, peace as opposed to violence, oppression. Is versus... nudity a universal human value? No, it's not. Okay, where did you get that from? Human nature, I think most people, there's some, I believe in something there's called natural law, human fitra. Uh, you know, so where are you getting has... fitra from? It's religion. I agree with no, you. No, fitra, fitra precedes religion. What, what, how do you know the fitra exists? Well, we know the, way, the we existence fitra of fitra. Nathan. We know the existence of fitra because it is mentioned, but we... In the Quran, the, exactly. As a concept, we okay. know. But exactly. even if there is no Quran, we would know what is On the right contrary, and wrong. Is, because that's a <laughs> theological debate. But I believe in Husn <laughs> Qubu <laughs> debate. I believe good and evil are rational. They are discernible by human reason. I also reason. believe partially yeah. what you're saying, but this is I know you're not contested. Ashari, but... This is yes. contested, as you're aware. Yes, very and much And people so. outside the faith would disagree with you. That's exactly why I brought up. We, you're, you're talking about tropes that we all agree with. Freedom and justice. Fine. Let's get to sexuality. Let's get to issues that are not as easily, de you know, uh, definable when it comes to, uh, to, to East versus West. I'll, I'll, I'll give you a very conservative, I'll, I'll uh, give you the, all the conservative credentials on sexuality. I'm not trying to promote that. I ask you a specific question, apostasy. You didn't discuss that. No, I, I did. I literally. Uh, you, I, you mentioned I, blasphemy, but on apostasy, can people leave Islam and take a other religion or become atheists or This secular. goes back and to the nation states involved. I am not in a position because the Sharia's perspective was But these nation and states are implementing these laws. It's in about a dozen Muslim majority and, countries. And, and can you tell me, I'm not defending any of them or criticizing any of them. Can you tell me when was the last time somebody was actually executed? This is just- Very a, few executions no, because it's Western pressure- you It's know, non-existent. Isn't. It's just a law to placate the people. You and I both know this. Okay, I, I want to I want to shift to another po <laughs> okay. point Sheikh uh, Qadi made, uh, Mustafa. So we can look at political systems from a purely theoretical level, or we can look at them from a practical level of what actually works. Um, 
Sheikh Yasser flipped a common narrative on its head that uh, dictatorships uh, don't let people flourish. He said, look at um, Iraq from the 60s to the 80s, look at Libya, um, countries that have had um, fairly high GDPs, um, health care, strong education. Um, how do you respond to those case studies and how do you see these ideas playing out, not just on a theoretical level. Uh, by the way, I need to say, I'm not defending dictatorships. Yes, yes, I'm yes, simply no, no, saying no. the simplistic notion, that's all I'm saying. Yeah. There is no defense of dictatorships, that's all. Good I know, you don't defend thing. it, I respect you <laughs> okay. for that. I've seen your takes okay. on those issues. <laughs> okay. Uh, and you criticize, actually, you told Muslims that there are many dictatorships in the yes. world of Islam, and yes. we're lucky to be not living under a dictatorship yes. here, so that, yes. that's a problem. And they would go after you and me and most people, right? I mean, for... Uh, there are countries, Iraq and Libya was mentioned, thanks to the oil money, <laughs> which comes from the ground. Of course, they got a lot of resources and they distributed to people, established some health care systems or free education and so on. They're good in themselves. But, you know, there are countries like Norway, which has the oil money and also a, a liberal democracy and freedom for everyone. Muslims, Christians, Jews, everybody uh, or atheist people as well. So, uh, I, I mean, yes, a dictatorship can give you a stable life and it can be better than a civil war. I mean, I, I, I'll, I mean I'll grant that that's a wisdom in our Islamic tradition. One day of anarchy is uh, worse than a thousand days of uh, tyranny. But do we have to choose between these options? I mean, either chaos and civil war, which we saw. I mean, we saw in Iraq, we saw in Syria, we saw in Libya. And w the West has to blame for that. Russia is to blame for that too. I mean, let's not forget that, especially in, in Syria. Uh, so yes, I mean, and let's not forget in the West, I mean, they had the French Revolution, thousands were slaughtered, guillotine, Napoleonic Wars. So these political systems are not easily established as a peaceful, coherent, just system, and it doesn't even stay like that. Mm -hmm. They start, begin to collapse. So there is no golden answer here, but the question is, do, are there universal human stand, universal declaration of human rights, for example? It was declared by some people in 1948. When we Muslims look at this, do we relate to this? Uh, there have been, some Muslims have published Islamic declarations of human rights that are somehow similar in some ways, but depart in some other ways. I think it goes back to the theological issue of whether things are right or wrong in themselves naturally and human reason can understand those. The Mutezila argued for those, the Maturidis argued for those in Islamic tradition. I know the Hanbali tradition is more complicated, Ibn Taybiyah. I think there are universal standards which we can understand and engage. So Christians call it natural law. I think that perspective exists and our Sharia conforms to that. Our Sharia actually reflects that. Timeless truths, murdering an innocent person is wrong. This is wrong before the Sharia, before Islam, before other religions. And Sharia comes and re reaffirms that to us and educates us about us. So if there are these universal values, we can discuss on them to establish political systems. So, okay, so, so universal on universal meaning. values, I wanna get uh, Sheikh Qadi's thoughts on this and then we can go mm -hmm. to a break. Um, so, is there something like natural law in Islam, maybe what Ibn Rushd called unwritten laws? What's your response? So, of course, I agree with uh, Mustafa's point that, of course, there are natural values. My point was the only way we know them is by religion. That's the whole point. And our founding fathers in this country were deists. And that's why they had this notion of God-given laws. You know, there's a God-given right of every human being to be treated uh, in a decent manner. I agree with this, and that's why religion is important. The problem comes is that how do you convince those outside of a faith paradigm? And again, let me give you some controversial examples. Abortion is a classic example here, a classic example of faith and secular law inherently clashing. As Muslims, we are not simplistic in this regard of the Christian notion where life begins at conception. No, it doesn't begin at conception for us. But I'm saying, for a Christian, let's just say, because the Muslims don't believe this, life does not begin at conception. Life begins after a certain number of days. But for a Christian who firmly believes that life begins at conception, how can you expect this Christian to distance himself from the reality that this is equivalent to murder? 
I mean, you sympathize with those worldview. Imagine if in a society somebody said toddlers are not considered human beings. Sati is a normal practice. We'd have to intervene and say, hold on a sec. A toddler is a child just because it's not dependent on its mother doesn't make it, you know, uh, not a human being. Imagine in a society until you're two, you're not considered a human being. And they said it's permissible to kill a toddler. We would object to that. A Christian has a different worldview to, to object to this. So my point here is Islamic law and Islamic Sharia in its own worldview is obviously being consistent. We need to cut them some slack in this regard that from their worldview, that's what they're doing. I understand here in America, we are not basing it on Christian or Sharia worldview, but we will find inherent contradictions. And we see this constantly when we're dealing with sexuality, with morality, constant updating. Now we're dealing with transgenderism. We're gonna constantly be changing the laws to reflect current sentiments of morality. My simple pushback to Mustafa and others is that we need to be careful that we we don't make the same mistake in other parts of the world. They need to learn from our uh, mistakes and, and, and uh, um, uh, falling short of our deals because when you do not have a higher system where you derive our morality from, you get this non-ending conundrum. Every few years, we'll change the laws to update what is, uh, what is um, uh, the latest fad. So yes, there are natural laws, but a secular society will never believe them. Sheikh Qadi, I'd like to ask you about uh, Khalifa's. Are they necessary on an Islamic viewpoint? Um, if you mean are they necessary for salvation, then no. You don't need to have a caliphate to, to live an ethical life and to um, enter God's kingdom or heaven to be a good Muslim. Uh, is it useful to have a caliphate? Yes, an ideal caliphate I think would be very useful to have. Is it realistic in the modern world? That is a question I don't have an answer to. I can't personally understand how we can have a caliphate in the modern nation state because the concept of a caliphate means if you are a Muslim, you will be a quote unquote citizen of that caliphate. How would that work in the global empire and the global United Nations? I, I don't know and I don't have an answer to that. Um, but I would like to say before I, I hand it over to, to, to Mustafa that one of the problems that we've had, forget the issue of caliphate, we haven't seen a viable, you know, modern nation state try to come forth with a version of democracy that is based on Islamic values. We don't have an Islamic democracy in place. And I think that is a far more viable goal that we should be aiming for. And even for those that are advocating a caliphate, may I suggest show us what a modern nation state would look like that is actually absorbing and imbibing the values of our faith and flourishing in the modern world. I think this is a more viable goal in the, in the immediate um, interim. And may I also say, again, I don't always want to bring up the, uh, the, the reality of Western hegemonic forces, but once again, I'm sorry to be awkward here, but one of the reasons why we haven't seen a, a viable uh, nation state that is faithful to Islam is that when such nation states have attempted to bring in Islamist governments, it's our countries and the superpowers that have intervened, most recently in Egypt, once again. So if we were to see a, a, a modern country that is trying its best to uh, give a interpretation of Islamic law in light of the modern world that could be a role model example. I think it would actually help assage many of the misunderstandings and stereotypes people have of our faith tradition. But what we've seen is that uh, when such a nation state begins to arise, when parties that are quote unquote Islamist in nature uh, seem to be overwhelmingly popular amongst the, the, the masses, uh, there seems to be a knee jerk reaction to in, uh, do surreptitious coups to get involved and get the military involved. And the fact of the matter is we don't want democracies in these countries, we meaning the uh, our, our own country. We'd rather prefer dictatorships that are servile unto us. And I think there is a level of hypocrisy that needs to be pointed out before, again, um, going back to the issue of, of caliphate. But yeah, your thoughts on the, that caliphate, Mustafa? Well, I agree a lot with Sheikh Yasser uh, on these remarks. I'll just add a few things. I'm from Istanbul, I feel Ottoman, so I mean, there are things about the caliphate that I admire and respect, I mean, I think that. But I see the caliphate not as a religious obligation on Muslims at every age. I see this as a part of the history of Muslims. I mean, this goes back to a discussion about what in our tradition is really religious, what is really historical. And I know, I mean, the classical understanding of the Sunni ulama, with exceptions, was 
The caliphate is an obligation on Muslims, not maybe every individual Muslim, but as a community, Muslims should live under a caliphate that, that enforces the Sharia. Uh, I would say, well, if I lived at the time, I would exactly think like that, because what are the options? I mean, the, what options are the alternatives are yeah. crusaders yeah. coming and slaughtering you, Mongols mm -hmm. coming and slaughtering mm -hmm. you. Classical Muslims could not imagine a political system where, which is not governed by Islamic law, which, is, which doesn't have a Muslim head of state, but they, in which they can be safe and which they can practice their religion freely. This never happened before. So that's why we are in a new environment and, and politics is an evolving thing in human history. So that's why I believe in new ideas. Now, in Islam, this was discussed whether, this is still being discussed, whether the caliphate is an obligation, whether it's a very important primary obligation today. I mean, the, the groups, that are, there are groups who are uh, focused on this. I know Sheikh Yasser is not f from that perspective, and I think I understand and respect his uh, pragmatism and, and level-headedness there. I would take another step. I would say, I agree with scholars like... Mehmet Said Bey from Turkey in 1920s, which is less known, I think, but Ali Abdel Razik from Egypt is better known in, in the West and in the Muslim world. They both argued that caliphate is a part of the history of Muslims, but it's not a part of religion. Uh, and uh, Abdel, Abdel Razik has this beautiful quote, Islam is a religion, not a state, a message, not a government. I agree with that perspective. Uh, that's why I believe if Islam itself is not a state model, Muslims can engage with different state models. Uh, they did. I mean, I, the idea of having a dynasty was not Islamic, <laughs> but Muslims had this for 13 centuries. I mean, uh, a caliphate that passes from son to father to son, this was not, not Islamic, but Muslims accepted the norms of the time and lived with that. I think in the modern world, we can, if there are better norms, that are better political systems, we can engage with those. That's why I believe in ideas of political liberalism and democracy are valuable. Uh, not that they should be a reason for colonialism or, or arrogance against Muslims, but with Muslims, their own uh, articulation should be discussed. So one thing I'd like to add, by the way, is that there is some talk now amongst many intellectuals of a... Uh, a proposition, if you like, of a new version of a caliphate, i.e., let's try to imagine a type of caliphate that is not political based, but rather uh, power based, i.e., what do I mean by this? Well, not necessarily power is in the right word here, but a title and a role in which there is respect given to a figure who can call for and rally people for Islamic causes and not necessarily for a particular area or regime. In other words, can we bring forth a version of the caliphate in which multiple nation states can come together and let's say the Palestinian issue is a classic example here. Let's say put some pressure on other bodies, say we're gonna come united as a block here and say we want uh, you know, a state for you know, these particular people, let's say. This is a modern manifestation of a type of theory of a classical uh, caliphate that might be totally novel. And I would be very open to that idea. Uh, I would be open to that idea as well. And I just would add, on, in all those issues, it's not just the Muslims, but also sometimes non-Muslims who rally for those causes and stand for the right uh, position. I mean, Ireland has been very vocal, for example, in its support for the Palestinians and, and, and standing for them when they're oppressed. Uh, on the other hand, you would have Muslim countries well, what we think about uh, the war between Armenia and Azerbaijan, I mean, Iran has a very different position. Turkey has a very different position. So it's not that easy to bring. So I think the idea that Muslims should come together, of course, to discuss our issues of the ummah, definitely. And we need better mechanisms for that. And we need more understanding. And first of all, less hostility between Muslim states. Uh, that includes Iran and Saudi Arabia and, and other Muslim majority countries. On the other hand, I think we're not a closed space. There are, there are human rights struggles. There are on the Uyghurs. Which countries will you bring in to stand for the Uyghurs? Will you bring Pakistan? Well, they don't want to get there because they have ties with China. But maybe you can do something with Western countries on that. So the issue is justice. We Muslims should stand for justice for us and for other people. And that can come through different mechanisms between Muslims and Muslims and other countries and, and NGOs, of course, as well. Good. So I want to shift to another question now, and that is, uh, on what basis do you think a government should make something legal versus illegal? Uh, Mustafa, I know you've 
before defended a distinction between sins and crimes. Um, the latter, the, the former, um, referring to a violation of an individual's responsibility to God, uh, whereas the latter is a violation of an individual's responsibility to other individuals. Um, I'd like to hear Sheikh Qadi's thoughts on that distinction. Is that a valid distinction? Um, uh, in your view, should the government be treating all sins as crimes? Or should the government also allow some things that are morally wrong uh, be legal? So, once again, we have to be pragmatic. I'm always like to, to, to bring in this reality. We can't expect all governments to be exactly the same. People are, are, are themselves living different types of lives. And so, for example, in this country, Alcohol was banned for, was it six years or five years? It was banned in the you know, 19th and 21st Amendment here. Why was it banned? Well, there were moral arguments given and there were religious arguments and there were social arguments given. All of them came together. They weren't, they weren't distinct from one another. In a Muslim country, should we allow easy access to alcohol? I would hope not. Why not? Why should they have easy access to alcohol? In a, so in a Muslim-majority country, we should take into account public sentiment that is stemming from broad morality that is itself stemming from religion. There's nothing wrong with that. Why should we, why should we demonize a Muslim country for taking its value and saying, hey, you know, we, now the, the counter argument would be, and Mustafa has brought this, not for alcohol, but for other things. Oh, but then you're forcing morality on people and God doesn't like forced morality. The response is very easy. Well, personal piety is one thing, public order is another. And I agree with you. I agree with you 100% that in a personal life, in a personal um, uh, 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 paradigm, if you are forced to do a good deed, that is not a good deed in the eyes of God. But you are neglecting the public morality aspect here. So if somebody wants to drink and he can't find access to drinking uh, because of the government, and you're like, this isn't morality in the eyes of God, I agree with you. The man is sinful for wanting to drink. But at the same time, I don't want ease of access, you know, for alcoholic drinks for, for my teenagers, for for society, and I think it is healthy and the lesser of two evils. By the way, in the prohibition, one of the reasons given to lift the prohibition is when you ban alcohol, then you force people to bootleg it, and the bootlegged alcohol is more dangerous than real alcohol, right? Bootlegged alcohol, you're gonna die from the intoxication, whatever it might be. Which happens in and Iran very the, often. the response to that is, and again, being very pragmatic and mathematical, the number of people who are harmed by bootlegged alcohol is much less than the entire society's harm by allowing the public consumption of alcohol. The cancer rates, the liver issues, the, 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 the drunk drivers, the entire uh, negatives that come from just flooding the market with alcohol, that is far bigger of a negative than the negatives that come when you ban it and then the things that happen behind the scenes here. The same paradigm can be applied for prostitution, for immorality, for all the other crimes that the Sharia considers to be immoral because in the end of the day, this, this distinction between immorality and between uh, um, uh, public disorder doesn't exist in the Sharia. That which is immoral, that which is a sin in the eyes of God is not healthy for society. So I don't want enforcement at the individual level, but I do want a public sentiment that is reflected in the values. Now what that is will vary. And so let's just give a simple example. Suppose a society is immersed in alcohol a Muslim society, and a government comes to power, they cannot ban alcohol overnight. They can't. But should they not try to work their way slowly but surely via preachers, via public awareness, via campaigns about the dangers, I would say yes, a government should do that until eventually a critical mass is achieved where the public sentiment says, yes, let's ban the sale of alcohol for all of our goods. This is my, 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 my you know, uh, point in a nutshell. Good, Mustafa, um, on what basis do you think the government should make something legal or illegal? The government should make things legal when there is harm to other individuals. So I believe in the harm principle that is in the classical liberal tradition. Uh, a person doing something that is not, uh, that is maybe harmful to himself, that is still a person's choice unless he's harming other ones. Now on this alcohol issue, I think differently than uh, Shah Yasser I mean, Iran has been banning alcohol for, of course, since the beginning of the Islamic Republic. Bootleg alcohol is a problem there. People die out of it. A lot of people drink secretly at, at home. So there's a lot of hypocrisy in society. Iran raised those. People have been punished for alcohol. I'll give you another example. I'm from Turkey. Uh, Turkey is a Muslim majority country. 
quite observant in many ways, uh, like 70, 80 people fast, percent of the people fast in Ramadan. Alcohol is free in Turkey since the Republic, actually in late Ottoman times too. By the way, we shouldn't forget that in Sharia, well, Sharia is applicable for Muslims, but Christians are not of course, <laughs> subject yeah. to it. So they can in the Ottoman purchase, Empire, yeah. Ottomans realized that, well, it's their religion which allows them to drink alcohol. So Christians could drink alcohol. So the idea that you should ban alcohol in a whole land is restricted. Restricted. Restricted, yeah. but you know, it, it's, it's their religious practices if There's you're a Catholic. always so, going to be bootlegging behind the scenes. So yeah. I don't believe in banning these things. I think Muslim, uh, coming back to Turkey, Turkey, it's free. Does this mean Turkey is a nation of alcoholics? No. A lot of people in Turkey never touch alcohol because they think it's haram. But it's not because government is telling them. Because they're religious, they don't touch it. Other people, in, in, I don't know, maybe 10, 20 percent of Turkish society, they drink. It's their way of life. Unless they drink and, you know, go uh, in public intoxication or drink and drive, do public things that are harmful. I think it should not be anybody's business. And the more we go on these things through the more coercive measures, we are creating tension in society. I mean, issues like this, which you bring up, I mean, alcohol, women's dress, these are simple issues, but these lead to endless tensions in Muslim societies. The Islamists will come, force us all to wear the hijab. The Islamists will come and so on and so forth. Then the Islamists should be suppressing, that leads to the secular dictatorship. So I think Turkey is not a bad example. Uh, Turkey's secularism was actually oppressive, so that was the major problem, but that's been rolled back in the past 10 years, uh, the oppressive secularism. In a Muslim-majority society, if some people drink, I think it should be their choice. The government would not promote it, I agree with that. Restricted even. Put, Restricted put in the sense of public intoxication, but if people drink, it is between them and God, it's a sin. Not every sin is punishable. And I think in, in classical interpretations of the Sharia, there's a tendency to punish things through tazir, every uh, impious action. But I don't think that is serving Islam even and, and doing anything good today in the modern age. In America, they gave up on alcohol ban partly because there was a huge mafia coming out of that, right? Like a century ago. So these things are, when you ban- so I don't it, want to support the mafia. <laughs> exactly. So maybe it's a better idea to let people do what they do, yeah. Good common ground. All right, so uh, Sheikh Yasser, um, can you please provide us just some closing thoughts, mm -hmm. maybe summarize some areas of common ground you see with Mustafa and then uh, reiterate maybe where you differentiate your Yeah, yeah, uh, so I think some of the common grounds that we do have is that we are wary of a coercive theological state. We have seen the realities of that in the last 30 years. And what happens when you allow carte blanche authority to religious fundamentalists is that there will be an inevitable backlash that is not good for society. And frankly, it's not good for religion. So we are both wary of that. I think where we disagree is, of course, the, the level of um, uh, uh, spirit that one takes from the religion to, to uh, uh, apply in the political realm. And I am somebody who is an advocate of soft religious values being advocated. And even if they're not applied, the government should at least soft encourage them. So I would say Turkey is an example of this where the government is clearly, you know, trying to bring about a, a positive image of, 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 of the Islamic tradition by it's, you know, even it's um, uh, uh, television shows, for example, Absolutely. right? Yeah, I mean, all the, the, these are, this is a soft uh, morality boost, which I think I'm, generally happy at, even though I don't like the historical inaccuracies of the, the documentary, but uh, the fact that the government should take an interest in the moral betterment of their peoples is an Islamic reality. And I think we should embrace that. We shouldn't be ashamed of it. Now, Western societies don't have that as a basic premise, so that's understandable. But Western society should allow Eastern countries or Muslim majority countries to find their own voice and their own mechanism. And I think it is healthy and it is a noble aspiration if Muslim majority countries take some inspiration from their religious values and try to bring about a society that is more conducive to one's spiritual purity uh, uh, than, and, and the aim should be to keep on improving that society generation to generation. I think that's a positive aspiration at the end of the day. Thank you, Dr. Qadi. Um, Mustafa, what are your closing thoughts? Maybe summarizing some common ground and- Yeah, I mean, we have a lot of common grounds uh, with Sheikh Yasser. I listen to his sermons, you know, I, most of the time I say, you know, I learn things or agree with his points. Sometimes we have differences, which has, I think, become clear here. Uh, I believe, uh, 
on all these issues of how, what do you ban or not, ultimately they're, they're democratic processes, right? I mean, the general conscience of a society influences law, and that's normal and that's natural. And of course, that will be different in Saudi Arabia from, say, Holland. I mean, that, that's natural. But if someone says this is what the religion commands and we are imposing it despite the public sentiments, that's a different thing, right? I mean, so that is legislating religious laws if there's no public demand for it. So uh, I would put there, the other thing is, I think in the Muslim world today, we Muslims should not have laws or attitudes that we would not like if it was done to us, right? Uh, we want to preach Islam to the whole world and give da'wah, you know? That's great. I mean, we want to give, uh, Muslims are free to distribute the Qurans, Islamic books, open mosques everywhere. That's wonderful. It's good that we have these freedoms. When we don't have those freedoms, like in China, like in India, we have to stand up against those. But then we should also respect non-Muslims having similar freedoms in Muslim-majority countries. And I think if we have laws about against those, which we do, I think we should reform those. This is not accepting Western hegemony, which a lot of people tend to think like that. I think this is about being principled. If freedom is a good value that we appreciate and we conscientiously understand, we should also uh, think about appreciating freedom in where we are the majority. And Muslims who think that we should suffocate freedom because we have to preserve morality or we should, we should kind of suppress freedom, it is good for religion, they're not even achieving what they want. I mean, what has Iran achieved in the past 40 decades, uh, four decades, 40 years? By imposing Islam on a society, they made the society even more secular than before. A lot of Iranians have, get, have given up on Islam, some converted to Christianity. You maybe see Iranian diaspora in the West, which tend to be, some of them tend to be very anti-Islamic. Well, this is what you, happens when you create a so-called Islamic regime that is imposing on people authoritarianism and, and religious coercion. Uh, I believe there are issues in the Islamic law we have to figure out uh, regarding that. But the question is, do we appreciate freedom as a universal principle or not? I think we should, and I do. And I do believe the obstacles to freedom in our religious tradition are mostly historical interpretations. They're not coming from the core of our religion, the eternal, unchanging core of our religion. That's the, uh, the, the, the Quran and the undisputable Sunnah prophetic uh, practice. Thank you. And, and with that, we'll bring this discussion to a close. Thank you, Dr. Qadi and Mustafa, um, for this dialogue. And I Thank encourage you. our audience to um, view more content by visiting actin.org slash Collins Center. Thank you. Thank you.